surface of the sea, a powerful new weapon is unleashed in World War I. The submarine. For some, it violates the code of the sea. Fair warning, rescue, honor. American Admiral Alfred Thayer Mahan in 1900 calls the submarine inhuman and cruel. A British admiral calls it underhanded, unfair, and un-English. Dating back to the 16th century, submarines at first are a primitive novelty. The evolution continues into the 20th century, a lethal arm of sea power, eventually appreciated most by the Germans. In the most notorious exploit in 1915, one submarine with one torpedo will sink one ship and an outraged neutral, the United States, will move closer to war. The name of the ship is Lusitania. In the years before World War I, Winston Spencer Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, is heavily influenced by an outspoken tutor, the former First Sea Lord Sir John Fisher, in the conviction that British sea power must include submarines, irreverently called Fisher's Toys. In Germany, similarly persuading the Kaiser is the naval chief, Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz. The Kaiser needs little persuasion, refers to the army, but my navy. In the early 1900s, Krupp is building subs for other nations, particularly Russia. Germany allows her rivals to spend money for development, then steps in and begins to build the best for herself. Not defensive short-range submarines, but long-range vessels for the offensive. By 1913, Germany is spending as much for submarines as she is for capital ships. When war comes, Germany has only 33 submarines but 28 are long range. Britain has 74, but only 18 are capable of much more than shore patrol. On September 22nd, 1914, the ominous German threat explodes into reality. The U-9 picks up three old British cruisers, Abu Kir, Hogue, and Cressy, steaming abreast off the Dutch coast. Abukir is hit, capsizes in 25 minutes. Hogue and Cressy come to a dead stop to pick up survivors. U-9 fires again, and again. Both cruisers are hit, both will sink. 1,400 men are lost. Stunned, the Admiralty issues new orders. Heavy ships are not to stop for survivors. Survivors will be left on their own. Germany now begins to exploit the new weapon as a form of blockade. This is a story of a unique war cruise. Unique because it is all recorded on motion picture film. The U-35 out of Trieste sails into the Mediterranean for a duck hunt among merchantmen. Its commander, Arnaud de la Perriere, a German with a French name, an enthusiast of a primitive new device, the cinematograph, the movie camera. The U-35 strikes on the surface and is still operating under the prize rules of international and maritime law. Fair warning for merchantmen. Each vessel is searched for contraband, its crew ordered to abandon ship. The U-boat commander does not waste a torpedo. He will use his deck gun. Only the merchant captain is taken aboard the crowded sub. The rest of the crew will have to make it by lifeboat.
Commander de la Perriere and the U-35 enjoy fantastic success. SS Maplewood, Iron Ore, Tunis to England, SS India, Coal, Cardiff to Oran, the Italian Stromboli, Iron Steel and Barbed Wire, Baltimore to Genoa. SS Corfu, Iron and Steel, Genoa bound. SS Nantmoor, Wheat, America to Genoa. There will be eight captains aboard before this cruise ends. The final target is a three-masted topsail schooner, Miss Morris, from Madagascar to England with a strange cargo. One of dubious strategic importance, a load of turtles. The German press trumpets these successes, often indicating they are in the North Sea, where the British fleet is patrolling, instead of the easier Mediterranean. But Germany is faced with a grave decision. Can the U-boats continue to surface, exposing their thin hulls, to warn, and then to sink? Or must they fight from below the surface, without warning? The answer will profoundly affect the war, and Germany. Since October 1914, Britain has enforced a blockade of the English Channel and the entire North Sea. The aim? To strangle Germany by choking off her supplies. Only a narrow channel for neutrals is left open. In February 1915, the Germans retaliate. All waters surrounding Britain are declared a war zone. Hostile merchant ships will be sunk without warning. Neutral ships are in danger because of alleged British misuse of neutral flags. There is shock. The idea of sinking unarmed merchantmen, of not rescuing crews, is abhorrent to most naval leaders. In Britain, the stern reality is this. A successful blockade will starve the island into submission in three months. But the German effort is something less than successful. By May 1915, only 51 of 15,000 ships entering Britain have been sunk. The trawler fleet is getting through. There is some belt tightening, but hardly cause for alarm. traffic into Britain perplexes and incenses the Germans. Everybody seems to be running the U-boat blockade, while few neutral merchantmen ever defy the British minefield blockade of Germany. The Germans cannot see that mines are more discriminating or less reprehensible than U-boats. Pincers of blockade are felt almost at once. Within a year, there will be food riots and people fighting for leavings at the garbage dumps of military camps. <laughs> 